Okay, we're going to jump right into our passage of Scripture again this morning. And so go ahead and get your Bibles out if you haven't already. Um, this is our Jesus for Everyone series where we're going through the book of Luke. Um, we're spending the whole year in Luke, and we're definitely going to go into next year as well as we uh, go through the book of Luke verse by verse. Um, so we're going to be in Luke chapter 6, and we're going to read verses 43 through 49 today. We will have scripture up on the screen if you didn't bring your Bible, but we'd love if you have your own Bible, open it up to there. Uh, it could be your digital Bible, your physical Bible. That's one of the ways we honor the Word of God is by doing the work. Amen? Amen. All right, so Luke chapter 6, verses 43 through 49. Um, after four weeks, we are finally finishing Jesus' great Sermon on the Mount. All right, now, now Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount is much shorter than Matthew's version. Luke's version is only one chapter, where Matthew's version is three. Okay, we've spent four weeks just on one chapter. How long do you think we would spend on just three, right? Crazy. And so let's read, and let's see how Jesus wraps up his sermon. Okay, you ready? Luke is ready to go. Anybody else ready this morning? All right, let's do it. Verse 43, it says, For no good tree bears bad fruit. Nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit, for each tree is known by its own fruit. For figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good, and the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. Verse 46, why do you call me Jesus, Lord, Lord, and don't do what I tell you? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who hears and does not do them is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation when the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. That's the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Let's go home, okay? All right, so over the past few weeks, like I've said, we've been going slowly through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, um, and we've learned that Jesus is forming this new nation that's been the theme over the past several weeks. And the purpose of his sermon is to teach everyone what his new nation is all about. He's, he's laying the law of the land out, so to speak. And, and we've learned two very important things about Jesus' new nation so far. Number one is that to be a part of this new nation requires thinking differently. Thinking differently. If you want to do something new, you can't think the same old way. Right? You need to adopt a new way of thinking, a new perspective. And in Luke's version of the sermon, Jesus challenges us to think differently about what it means to be blessed. Are you blessed? Yeah. How do you know? Well, Jesus says that, that the world says blessing looks like what happens here and now. But Jesus says blessing is dependent on your future, on your future. If you follow Jesus, the greatest blessing that you'll receive is not here and now. But it's in the future, eternal life, heavenly treasures that can't be stolen from you, that moth and rust can't destroy, experiencing the full presence of God. That's true blessing that we need to think about and prepare for. Then the second thing we learned is that to be a part of this new nation requires treating people differently. Like all earthly nations, people in Jesus' new nation must consider their relations with different people. Uh, there are external relations that we need to think about. How do you treat and respond to your enemies, Jesus said. And then there are internal relations. How do we treat and respond to fellow citizens? When it comes to enemies, what do we do? We love them. When it comes to fellow citizens, we're called to forgive them and be generous with them. And so that's what we've gone over so far in Jesus' sermon. And then in the final passage, he switches from thinking horizontally Okay, how do we treat the people around us uh, to thinking vertically? What does our relationship with God look like? Because everything Jesus has talked about so far, thinking differently, treating people differently, 
It amounts to nothing if we're not also taking personal responsibility, taking personal responsibility for our relationship with God. Because in order to think differently and treat people differently in the way that Jesus is teaching here, we must first root ourselves and build upon the things of God first and foremost. If we say that we are part of Jesus' new nation, if we're citizens of the kingdom of God, then we can't be rooted in worldly things. We can't build our lives the way the world says we should build our lives or upon its morals and values. So when it comes to taking personal responsibility for our relationship with God, Jesus narrows it down to two things in this passage, and they are pursuit and practice. Everybody say that with me. Pursuit and practice, which is also the title of today's message. Now, before we unpack that, I'd love to pray again and prepare our hearts for what the Lord has for us this morning. And so, Lord, we are so grateful for you that, that you do have something to give to each one of us. Every single person who's come in this church today is not here by accident. God, you have ordained them to be here. I truly believe that. And you have something to share with them. And so, Lord, we, we're here today to receive from you. We open our hearts, we open our minds to hear from you, to be led by you, to be guided by you. God, we even open our hearts to be corrected by you if, if need be. And we know, God, that you are gentle, you are kind. And so would you help us to walk in obedience to you and the things that you have for us? We love you. We say all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. All right. When I was a kid, um, I remember thinking a lot about one particular question, probably the most important question that a young mind ponders in their adolescent years, and that is, what do I want to be when I grow up? How many of you remember thinking that question yourself? Absolutely. That's a big question for a young mind, isn't it? I don't know about you, but this question dominated much of my thought life when I was a kid. I remember this question being a subject of many writing prompts and assignments in school, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? I'd love to hear from some of you. What did you want to be when you grew up? Paleontologist. Paleontologist? Rich? Did I hear rich? Yes. What else? Actress. Actress, all right. Maybe you're still waiting to grow up. What do you still want to be when you grow up? Starfighter pilot, like you want to be on Mars and like take out the, the eight? Okay, all right, there we go. Um, what do you want to be when you grow up? Uh, I remember wanting to be so many things, so many things, and it was hard to choose just one. And I was like, I have to choose just one? That's a lot of pressure. When I was very little, kindergarten and, and early elementary, I just wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. That's all I wanted to be. <laughs> I just wanted to be a Ninja Turtle. I, I remember telling my friends and even my family to stop calling me by my name. Stop calling me Kai and just call me Donatello, <laughs> my favorite Ninja Turtle. I also wanted to be a spy or a secret agent. I remember writing about that a lot. I wanted the cool James Bond car with an ejector seat inside of it. And then when some cruel adult introduced me to reality... And I learned that I would probably never be a Ninja Turtle or a spy. I decided that I wanted to be an entomologist, an entomologist. I wanted to study bugs. And when I found out that that could be a job, I was like, yeah, let's be an entomologist. Um, which really, I think entomologists are just a bunch of big kids who get to still play with bugs. That's it. Um, I also wanted to be an inventor which evolved into me wanting to be a robotics engineer. The 1980s film, Short Circuit, raise your hand if you know that amazing movie. Yes! Uh, if you haven't seen it, you need to watch it. But with robot Johnny Five, he's alive, right? Uh, that was a big inspiration for that. And then when I was introduced to musical instruments, orchestra and band, and when I discovered that I had some natural talent for music, I finally settled on wanting to be some kind of musician, uh, even a composer. Um, and so throughout junior high, high school, and my college career, I pursued all things music. Concert band, symphony band, jazz band, marching band. I even went to band camp. I was one of those kids, band camp. 
Instead of memorizing lyrics to, to the popular music of the 90s and the early 2000s, I memorized melodies and movements to classical and jazz music. Uh, anyone who would have looked at me in my life at that time, they would have easily recognized that I was a huge music nerd, okay, because my pursuit produced fruit in my life. Okay, my pursuit of music produced the fruit of being involved in as many musical things as I could. And the same is true for you in your life too. Your pursuit produces fruit. So what are you pursuing in life right now? We all have pursuits. Some of you, you're pursuing a husband or a wife right now, right? If that's true, then the fruit of your pursuit should be that you're presenting yourself to the world as available, right? You're hanging out with singles, hopefully. Maybe you're exploring that crazy world of online dating, right? Okay, if you're not doing any of that, then you can't really say you're pursuing a spouse. Where's the fruit? Where's the fruit? Uh, some of you are pursuing a career. What's the fruit of that? Are you in college? Are you going through some kind of training, bettering yourself? Are you sending your resume to potential employers? Some of you are, are pursuing better health. Where's the fruit of that? Are you exercising, eating healthy, getting enough sleep? Right? I, th I think you get the picture. Your pursuit produces fruit. And in verses 43 through 45, Jesus is saying something very similar, but as it relates to pursuing a relationship with God. If you're pursuing a relationship with God, then that should produce some kind of fruit in your life. There should be evidence that supports your pursuit. And Jesus uses two metaphors to explain this truth. He uses the metaphors of trees and treasures. Trees and treasures. Uh, Jesus was really good at connecting with his audience in a relevant way. And society at that time revolved around agriculture. Much of his parables were about agriculture. People understood the process of growing things for food much better than we do in the modern age. Um, but there was also a lot of poverty during that time. Most people, including Jesus, grew up poor and having very little. And when you're materially and financially poor, struggling to get by, you tend to think a lot about money or treasures. And so Jesus, he starts by talking about trees. If a fruit-bearing tree is good and healthy, then what do we expect from that tree? Good fruit, right? But if the tree is not good and healthy, what can we expect from it? Bad fruit. Okay, it would be crazy to expect bad fruit from a good tree and good fruit from a bad tree. It defies the laws of nature that God has built into it. It is also, also totally insane to believe that a fig tree would produce grapes or that a grapevine would produce figs. It defies the laws of nature. A tree can only produce fruit of its own kind. Now, who knows what GMOs and all that kind of stuff will produce in our modern age, but generally speaking, <laughs> the way God designed it, that's the way it works. And what Jesus is saying is that you can't say you're pursuing a relationship with God if you're also trying to pursue a relationship with the world. Yeah. You can't say that you want to be a part of Jesus' new nation, the kingdom of God, if you're also trying to be a part of the kingdom of the world. Why? Because those two different kingdoms produce very different fruit. Right. Very different fruit. Right. And if you say you are pursuing one thing when you're actually pursuing another, listen, your fruit will betray you. Your fruit will betray you. Paul says it this way in Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. He says, now the works, or we could say the fruits, the fruits of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity. Hey, Luke, could you take another guy with you out into the lobby real quick? Thank you, sir. He says this in uh, 5, 19 through 21. He says, now the works, the fruits of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not, what, inherit the kingdom of God. 
And so if you say you are pursuing a relationship with God, if you say you're a part of the kingdom of God, but these things we just read are, are fruits of your life, your fruit betrays you. And it tells what you're really after because your pursuit produces fruit. And so what kind of fruit should be produced then if we are pursuing a relationship with God? Well, thankfully, Paul continues in Galatians, and he says in verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, you all know it, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Okay, so when someone, when you are planted, rooted and growing in Jesus' new nation, these will be your fruits. It's evident what someone is pursuing when these are your fruits. It's you're pursuing a relationship with God. Everybody tracking with me so far? All right. Another way to think about it, Jesus says this, is by thinking about what kind of treasure you're pursuing. What kind of treasures are you pursuing? Again, we all have treasures we're going after in this life. Material, financial, relational, physical, emotional, spiritual. And you can tell what treasures someone is pursuing by what they talk about the most. Right? Because you talk about what you treasure. When I was pursuing music, I talked a lot about music. When I was pursuing Annette to be my wife, I talked a lot about Annette. <laughs> right? Uh, Annette and I, we adore our children. We love them so much. And so what do you think we talk about a lot? Our children, even when we're on a date, just the two of us, we can't help it but talk about our kids. I know many of you and what your treasures are because you talk about them a lot. You talk about them. And the things you treasure are the things that you also keep closest to your heart. We've heard that before. That sentiment still translate well with us, right? In our modern time, we understand that. But what Jesus does is he explains further that treasures can also either purify or corrupt our hearts. Okay, think, uh, think Smeagol, right? And the ring of power. That thing corrupted him, right? To the worst possible place you could ever be, right? Okay, if we pursue good treasures, Jesus says, then our hearts will be good, but if we pursue evil treasures, our hearts will be evil. All right, how do we know if our treasures and our hearts are good or evil? You talk about what you treasure. Love. You talk about what you treasure. And so if evil talk comes out of your mouth, like lies, curses, negative judgment and criticism, like we talked about last week, condemnation and such, then your heart is being corrupted by evil treasure. If good talk comes out of your mouth, kindness, forgiveness, encouragement, gratitude, and things like these, then your heart is being purified by good treasure. All right, but let me just say this. A church setting like this that we're in right now is not always the best place to determine if someone's words tell the truth about what they really treasure. Because when we gather at church on Sundays, it's really easy to follow a script, isn't it? Okay, got to be on my best behavior. Jesus is watching, right? Got to smile. Got to say, sir and ma'am, please and thank you. Sing the songs. Follow along in my Bible. Try to stay awake during the sermon, right? Nod and say amen to show that I'm listening. Say the right things. How are you? I'm good. Well, God is good all the time, right? It's easy to follow a script at church. But what about when you're in a less formal environment? like at home, or hanging out with the boys, with the girls, when there's no script involved at all, what do you really talk about? Do your words and your actions at church carry over into that less formal environment? All right, listen, the hope and the goal is that we, what we say and what we do at church isn't scripted at all, but that it's genuine. That what we get from each other at church is the same thing that we would get in our homes in the real world too. But if they're different, then there's an issue with your treasures and your heart that we need to consider. And so church family, what are you pursuing? What are you pursuing in life? Are you pursuing a relationship with God? Are you pursuing the kingdom of God? Well, what is the fruit of that? There should be something. What is the fruit of that? Because your pursuit produces fruit. But we don't want our fruit to betray us either, do we? 
because your fruit also reveals your, your pursuit. You also talk about what you treasure. If you're pursuing the treasures of heaven, the kingdom of God, then your talk should reflect that too. And so here are three um, helpful verses that I think um, about often to make sure I'm pursuing the right things and so that I'm, I'm producing good fruit and good talk in my life. Can I share those with you? Okay, the first one is this, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And go ahead and write these down. These are really good to, to reflect on throughout the week. Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, where Paul says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about, right, pursue these things. The second one is also from Paul, and it's actually from a lengthy passage. that I won't read the whole thing today, but it's found in Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And I would challenge you to read that passage over and over again this week. It's similar to what Paul says in Philippians, but it starts out in verses 1 and 2 saying this, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek, pursue the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds, right? Pursue the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. And the passage, it goes on to explain the things of earth that we shouldn't be pursuing and the things of heaven that we should. And then here's the third one. It's actually taken from Jesus' sermon on the mount. Not here in Luke, but from Matthew. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first, right? Pursue first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then there's fruit, Jesus says, and all of these things will be added to you. Do you want good fruit in your life? Do you want a pure heart from which good talk flows from your mouth? Then take personal responsibility for your relationship with God. Pursue his kingdom. Pursue his righteousness. He says, then all of these things will be added to you. It's pretty simple, right? I love that Jesus teaches simply and plainly. And so we can learn a lot about someone and ourselves and our relationship with God by looking at what, what we're pursuing in life because your pursuit produces fruit that everyone can see. All right, but, but here's the next part. Your pursuit also produces practice. Your pursuit also produces practice. If you are sincere about something, that sincerity is going to be seen in your actions or in the things that you talk about, right? Uh, there's a scene from the greatest show in the history of mankind called The Office um, from season seven, episode 23, if you're wondering, <laughs> called The Inner Circle, if you're wondering even more, um, where The Office's new boss, D'Angelo Vickers, uh, played by Will Ferrell, that funny guy, um, but he claims to be a professional motivational juggler. How many of you are familiar with that scene? It's okay. You can say you watch The Office. I watch it too. It's fine. All right. So he says, I'm a professional motivational juggler. Seems too good to be true, right? Well, that's what others in The Office think. And so they, they tell D'Angelo to perform his routine for them. Now, D'Angelo kind of backpedals, right? He starts making some excuses about not having enough space in the room. And it seems that maybe he's not being sincere about being a professional motivational juggler. And so they press him some more. And D'Angelo, he eventually walks out of the office. He goes to his car to see if he brought his, his juggling balls with him. After a few moments, D'Angelo comes back with some sad news. He thought he left his juggling balls in the trunk of his car, but they're not there. Ah. And so the office funny guy, Andrew Bernard, he reaches into his desk drawer and he reveals that he too is an avid juggler. And, he's, and so he, he throws his juggling balls to D'Angelo, but D'Angelo like dodges them and he like doesn't catch them because he's vowed to never touch another juggler's instruments is what he says. <laughs> and so is D'Angelo really a professional motivational juggler? He sounds sincere. He sounds really serious. He won't, you know, mess with another person's juggling balls. He's, he, he sounds serious, but you can imagine the doubt that's starting to solidify in people's minds. Okay, but, but then D'Angelo, he says this. He says, you know what? We're all here. I've got the music for my routine queued up on the stereo. How about I perform just without the juggling balls? Wow. 
Some in the office, they, they start laughing, thinking that D'Angelo is joking, because obviously that's ridiculous, but he's not joking. He hits play on the stereo, and then he goes through his juggling routine just like this. About two minutes, in a, two and a half minutes, a whole song, just juggling without juggling balls. It's a hilarious scene, and I highly recommend that you go look it up on YouTube for a really good laugh. But at the end of it all, okay, after the whole routine, and he finishes with a big, you know, imaginary finish, you're still left wondering if D'Angelo is really a professional motivational juggler. We're not sure, because although D'Angelo sounds sincere, he presents himself as a serious juggler and even goes through the motions of the juggling routine, but he never actually juggles. We never get to see him put his juggling into real practice. Although it's a funny and ridiculous scene, there's actually a lot of similarity between D'Angelo and how many Christians practice their faith today. Many people, they make that professional claim or that profession that they are Christians. Many people sound sincere and serious about their faith. They know what the Word of God says. They know how they're supposed to live as Christians. They even come to church on Sundays and they, they sing the songs. They raise their hands in worship. They bow their heads in prayer. They nod along as the pastor preaches. But are they simply going through the motions? Are they simply jugglers without juggling balls? Okay, the, or are they going through that, that script that we, we talked about? You see, the only way to really know if their pursuit of God and, and a relationship with Him is genuine is not just by their fruit, but also by their practice outside of the four walls of the church. Yeah. And so Jesus, he, he finishes His sermon, not just here in Luke, but also in Matthew 7, talking about the importance of putting His words into practice. Taking personal responsibility for your relationship with God isn't just about reading Scripture and listening to sermons, learning everything that you can about God and His kingdom. It's also about obedience, doing what Jesus says, not just in church, but in the real world too. Yeah. Because if all we ever do is read or listen to Jesus' words, but we never practice them, are we sincere in our pursuit of God? Are we serious about being a citizen in Jesus' new nation? Because sincere pursuit produces a practice in your life. Yeah. Not only that, but Jesus says that if we listen to his words, but we never do them, if it will only lead to collapse in our personal lives. He says listening to his words, but never actually practicing them, is like someone who builds a house on the ground without a foundation. Right. Now, it's pretty general knowledge that foundations are really important in construction, aren't they? You want a house that will stand forever for a long time, you need a good foundation. But without a foundation, a house will collapse and be swept away when flooding and crisis comes against it. Okay, and listen, the, the foundation isn't made up of just the word of God only. You see, many people think that as long as they know God's word as long as they know what Jesus says, then everything's going to be all right in their life. As long as they're memorizing scripture and, and they, they know what the word of God says. There's even a, an old hymn called Standing on the Promises. How many of you know that song? Yeah. Okay, a few of us. The verse goes like this. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let its praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. That's the, then the refrain, it goes like this, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, and everybody rings it out until the conductor says, I'm standing on the promises of God. Sounds good, right? But what does the song mean by the promises of God? Well, the second verse it says this. You get to bear with my singing a little bit more. It says this. Standing on the promises that cannot fail when the howling storms of doubt and fear prevail. Kind of like what Jesus is talking about in this pa passage. By the living word of God, I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God. And so according to the song, standing on the promises of God is standing on the word of God. That the word of God 
is our firm foundation. All right, now listen. It is true that the Word of God will always remain. Amen? It is true that God's promises will never fail us. Amen? When the storms of life come our way, we can certainly turn to the Word of God for comfort and guidance. We should do that. And so the song is not wrong, but it's also not complete. Because Jesus is actually saying the exact opposite in his sermon of what the song is saying. He's saying that his words, the word of God alone, is not enough to sustain you through life's challenges. That just knowing what Jesus says isn't enough to get you through the crisis. But it's the word of God and obedience to that word that will sustain you. I know it's a challenging word this morning, but these are Jesus' words. It's exactly what he's saying. Because it's obedience that proves God's promises in your life. God's word, to, for it to prove that it's true, comes with obedience. Because Jesus tells us what to do for our benefit and because he's our Lord, right? He's our king. He loves us. He cares for us. He knows better how to live this life than we ever could. He demonstrated that. And so when he says to do something, it's for our benefit and blessing. But the only way to receive that blessing is if we obey if we practice Jesus' words for ourselves. Okay, listen to what James writes. This is James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. He says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. James is Jesus' little half-brother. And so little James must have been listening to Jesus while he was growing up. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And what James is saying is obedience always leads to blessing in a believer's life. Do you want to be blessed? Obey the words of Jesus. And what I love about what James says here is that we are quick to forget God's words when all we do is hear them. If all we ever do is read the word of God, even if we just memorize it and hear it over and over again, James is saying we are quick to forget it. But when we hear and obey them, God's word becomes permanent and planted in our life. And so watch this. Your pursuit produces practice, and your practice produces permanence in your life. This is especially important when we experience crisis in our lives, when the floods rise and the streams break against us. All right, I want you to imagine uh, a Tucson firefighter responding to a car and a driver that's trapped in a flooded road during the monsoons. Okay? This happens every year in Tucson, doesn't it? And there are road signs that say, do not enter when flooded. And every year, people enter when flooded, yeah. right? Yeah. Every year. And who has to go and save them? Tucson firefighters, right? But do you know who gets to foot the bill? The person getting rescued. Ha, 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 See, our, our very own Mark Cromie, he's not here today, um, but he's a firefighter. and He's responded to these calls and had to save people. And these can be pretty scary and dangerous situations. A normal person like you and me, we wouldn't really know how to respond. We probably wouldn't even wade out into the waters to rescue someone for fear of our own lives. But what's amazing is how calm, cool, and collected firefighters are when they respond to these dangerous situations. They don't run away. They don't freak out and give up in the middle of it. They know exactly what to do. Right? They move and they act quickly. They work well with their other firefighters to get the job done. Right? Do you know how they're able to be so efficient and effective in the middle of such dangerous and stressful situations? Practice. Practice. They train for this stuff all the time. Right? They practice putting on and taking off their rescue gear over and over and over again. They practice pulling ropes and using their rescue tools. They go over scenarios and, and practice how they would respond. They practice for hours and hours before they ever actually have to rescue someone. 
And it's that practice that makes them successful in those crisis situations. And so when the floods rise and the streams break against us in our own lives, it's not just hearing and knowing the Word of God that will save us and keep us faithful to Him. It's our daily practice of the Word that gets us through the crisis and leads us into blessing. It's that muscle memory of obedience to the Lord that saves us in the middle of stressful situations. Okay, the floods will come. They will, every single one of us. But it won't shake us if our faith is well built on the foundation of God's word and obedience to his word. Do you hear what I'm saying, church family? Or think of it this way. What is your response when crisis comes your way? I love a few times ago when, when Miguel spoke and he talked about what comes out of your bucket whenever it's kicked over. I love that so much. It's such a good analogy. What is your response when, when crisis comes your way? What is your reaction when you encounter struggles and hardships in your life? Does your faith waver in that moment? Do you start to doubt God's goodness? Do you turn to other people and things for rescue? If yes, then the answer Jesus would say is it's time to apply the words of Jesus to your life and be a doer of the word and not just a hearer. It's time to stop simply going through the motions like a juggler without juggling balls. And it's time to practice your faith in your everyday life. But some of you, you have some really, really hard stories that uh, I've been able to hear that you've shared with me. There are some terrible and painful experiences represented in this room. The loss of children, young children. Being abused by people who you thought loved you. Terminal medical diagnoses. Faithful employees who, who work hard for their employers but then get let go and they're, they're left in, in financial hardship. I mean, I've, I've heard many of your stories and experiences that I've never personally experienced. And I think, how in the world do you not just blame God and give up and lose your faith? But then I look at your pursuit of God and I see the sincerity. You say, Lord, Lord. And you mean it. Jesus is your king. Your pursuit actually produces good fruit in your life. You treasure the things of God, and so you talk about the things of God, not just here on Sundays, but but in your homes and, and wherever you go. You don't just know what the Word of God says, but you actually do it in your life. You love your enemies. You love your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ and show them forgiveness and generosity. And through that pursuit and practice, God has shown you, I know time and time again, how faithful to his promises he really is. And because of all of this, it produces, I can see it, a permanence, a stability of faith in your life that is incredible, amazing. No wonder you stay faithful to God. And and your testimonies that you've shared with me, they encourage me to keep pursuing God to keep seeking his kingdom and his righteousness, to keep practicing God's word. Because I know that crisis is going to come my way at some point in my life. Not that I haven't had any, but I know there's still more to come. And I want to remain faithful to God because he's been so faithful to me. And so I think Jesus' words here at the end of his sermon are good reminders for all of us. Would you agree? Okay, what are you pursuing in your life and what are you practicing? Are you, the person that you hear on Sunday mornings, is it the same person at home with your family, at the workplace, on campus, wherever you're going? Are you pursuing the things of God and, and practicing His ways? What do you need to change in your life so that you can say, I belong to Jesus' new nation, the kingdom of God, but to also ensure that your words line up with your actions and the way you live? I would say to you, and Jesus would say as well, commit to making those changes and believe that God's blessing will come. And so what are you beholding, church family, and what are you becoming?